Hi folks, and welcome to White Collar Week. It's the isolation that destroys us. The solution is in community. Today on the podcast, we have Bob Katzberg, a dean of the White Collar Bar, who has seen it all as both a federal prosecutor in the Eastern District of New York and as a criminal defense trial attorney. I was so taken with Bob's book, The Vanishing Trial, that I sent it in to every single one of our White Collar Support Group members currently serving in prison. In it, Bob explains how and why the federal criminal justice system went from 10% of the cases being tried before juries to less than 2% of the cases now being tried before juries, and how the deck is now stacked against defendants and how it forces them into plea bargains. If you are being prosecuted for white collar crime or for any crime, or if you have a friend, family member, or colleague who are being prosecuted for a crime, this episode is a must watch or must listen to. So coming up, Bob Katzberg, The Vanishing Trial on White Collar Week. I hope you'll join us. Hello, and welcome to White Collar Week, a podcast sponsored by Progressive Prison Ministries, the world's first ministry serving the white collar justice community. I'm Jeff Grant, co-founder and your host. I served almost 14 months in a federal prison for a white collar crime I committed when I was a lawyer. So I know that it's the isolation that kills us and the solution is in community. So let's get started. Hi folks, and welcome to White Collar Week. Today we have a very special podcast. We have one of the deans of the White Collar Bar from New York, although he lives in California now, Bob Katzberg, and he wrote this incredible book called The Vanishing Trial. I'm holding it up right now for those of you listening and uh, not watching. And the subtitle is The Era of Courtroom Performers and the Perils of Its Passing. And uh, we're going to go into all of that and a lot of Bob's background as well. Um, it's a um, memoir, but with incredible stories. Um, Bob came to my attention, um, I guess, when the book came out. And he, uh, he wrote to me and um, back in the fall. And our friend Walt Pavlo wrote an article about the book in his Forbes column. So uh, I've known about the book for a while and I was so happy to connect with Bob and uh, we'll get to talk about it. So uh, here's Bob Katzberg. Bob, welcome to White Collar Week. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, I have to tell you that the conversation we had a week or two ago was one of my favorite conversations I've had in such a long time because I got to really talk about old white collar war stories and things with you. So that was, that was spectacular. I enjoyed it too, believe me, it was great. So Bob, wh- why don't we spend, I don't know, five, five or 10 minutes and you can just kind of go into um, what's in the book, but um, your, uh, your background, how you came to become a white collar attorney um, and then we can start getting into some stories and then what, what the actual point of the vanishing trial is about. Sure. Um, uh, I, as I say in the book, um, I started to think about and desire to become a trial lawyer when I was 10 years old, when I realized I wasn't going to pitch for the Yankees, that my uh, pitching skills were somewhat uh, less than they should be, mm-hmm. and that I should give up my dream of being, at the time, my hero, Whitey Ford. And so um, I started to think about other things. And then um, when I was a junior in college, uh, um, I went to see F. Lee Bailey try the Carl Coppolino, Dr. Carl Coppolino case in Freehold, New Jersey. And in those three days of, of um, cutting school and playing hooky, um, I learned so much more than I would have in my classes mm-hmm. and uh, just watching Bailey um, perform. I was enamored and I looked at it and I said to myself, that's what I want to do. That's who I want to be. And so uh, obviously I went to law school and um, uh, realized that the correct, the elite uh, path forward to become a really established white collar lawyer was as follows that in law school, you had to make law review, which is the top 10% of your class. Uh, And then take that into a federal clerkship, which is 
very competitive, very difficult to get, but it allows you to sit in on the district court, watch trials, uh, sit with judges, listen to them, learn from them, how they view things, uh, to watch the entire process from the judge's point of view, understand how decisions are made, um, and then go to the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, where the, it's really the high level of of uh, federal criminal justice in the United States. It's where the power of the federal sovereign um, comes into being uh, sure. over my career. I represented a mm -hmm. lot of very wealthy people, but mm -hmm. none of them had the money of the US Treasury. And none of them had FBI agents working for them or IRS agents or whatever. So I followed that career path. I um, graduated law school and uh, I made law review. I graduated law school. I got a federal clerkship in Washington, DC. Uh, came back to New York and was a federal prosecutor in the Eastern District of New York for almost five years. Uh, learned what I had to learn, tried a, you know, a, a good number of cases, case yeah. after case, trial after trial, uh, developed trial skills and switched sides. Uh, in uh, 1977, Ken Kaplan, who was then the deputy chief of the criminal division in the Eastern District of New York, he and I were close friends. And we started a law firm that lasted 39 years. You know, this, so there's two things I didn't tell you um, when, we, uh, when we spoke last. Um, one of them, um, when, you, uh, when we spoke, you mentioned that you had gone to C.F. Lee Bailey. And I did too. When I was in college, oh. he was trying a case in Rochester, New York. And mm -hmm. I was going to a little college outside of Rochester. And uh, one of my roommates and I uh, went and interviewed him for our school paper and he granted us the interview. Wow. So the connection when I was reading it in your book That's and you had told me about it. And I remember sitting down with him and we were scared. You know, this, oh, is sure. F, this was F. Lee Bailey, we were shaking. Exactly. And <clears throat> we asked him two questions that I recall. The first question was, if you could give advice to college students, how to become a great trial lawyer, what's the one piece of advice you would give them? And to this day, I remember his answer was, master the King's English. Okay. So that was, sure. that, that stuck with me all these years. Be well spoken, absolutely. Right, the second thing um, we asked him, at that point he had lost 10 or 11 cases in a row. And um, we asked him, why is, why do you have such a, poor batting average. And he said that um, he only gets hired for impossible cases. Okay. And I thought that was so fascinating. Yes, no, no, I, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the tragedy of Bailey is that he's only remembered today for his role um, in the O.J. Simpson case, his sure. small role there. Um, uh, and but by that time in his career, you know, he had been, he was much older and he had some serious personal problems over the years. Yeah. And those problems, you can't divorce your personal situation mm. from uh, what you do uh, professionally. I mean, there was a very, uh, I won't mention his name, but there was a very well-known criminal lawyer in New York who mm -hmm. we all respected greatly. Mm -hmm. And uh, his son died in a car crash. The son was, I think, uh, 15, 16 years old. Mm -hmm. And um, he became an alcoholic mm. and he, his career went right down the tubes. He was this magnificent, handsome, well-spoken, uh, terrific trial lawyer. Mm. Um, all right, I'll give you his name, Joe Marqueso. Mm. Um, and, and, and everybody loved him and everybody was heartbroken. Mm, of course. What to him. And then, but he, but his personal, um, his personal, problems was so overwhelming that he yeah, could of course. Not, and I think Bailey was a variation. <clears throat> yeah. Well, but when I saw him, he was, he was in his prime and he would strut around the courtroom for those three days that I watched it in Freehold, New Jersey. And um, I was memorized, I mesmerized. I just said, boy, that's who I want to be. You know, I, w I was taken um, by all the, um, references you had to the judges who you had, um, the judge you had served under and then the relationships. Yeah. And, and 
the collegial nature of the white collar bar. Um, pro- probably, probably even more so when you when you uh, went on the defense side. Oh, totally, totally. But, but so, so why don't you take us through? Um, now you have all this trial experience, which is what happens uh, at least back then. When yeah. you, when you were um, when you were a federal prosecutor, right? Oh, by, by the way, wh- why the Eastern District? Why not the Southern District? Why? Well, I had I was a summer assistant in the Southern Southern District the summer before, mm-hmm. and the Southern District had a two year rule that you are not allowed. They were not allowed at the time. Uh, Whitney North Seymour Jr. was the U.S. Attorney, and uh, I had become friendly with a number of uh, the uh, lawyers there, and it was a great summer. I learned a lot. And I wanted to go there originally, and um, but I was I found out unfortunately that you had to be out of law school two years. I was only out of law school one year, according to Judge Gash, and the Eastern District did not have that rule. As it turned out, it was a, it was a luckier break for me because yeah. um, the Southern District uh, is a much larger, more entrenched mm-hmm. outfit. In the Eastern District, I was able to try a lot of cases. Yeah, because we had Kennedy Airport uh, and uh, thefts of cargo, uh, narcotics cases, whatever. Mm-hmm. And um, I ended up probably trying more cases in the Eastern District than I would have in the Southern District yeah. um, um, because of that. And, 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 and as a less um, as a smaller uh, office, even though it's hardly a small office. Yeah, exactly. It's anything but small, but it, relative to the Southern District, it's relatively small. I'm able to rise up and go from street crime, you know, narcotics cases, uh, thefts of cargo from Kennedy Airport to doing white collar stuff, to doing tax cases and uh, a lot of business crimes. And um, it was really that experience prosecuting those cases, which opened up the door for me to defend those cases because I knew how the other side was acting. I knew how they were constructing the cases. I knew what was important and wasn't. So how is it that you went, because in Eastern District, it, um, I think it's pretty known as a, uh, a court that tries a lot of mob cases, a lot of, yes. a lot of yeah. drug cases. Yep. Um, but, but you developed an expertise in white collar and white collar prosecutions and specifically white collar tax crimes. Correct. So how'd that happen? Well, uh, uh, strangely enough, um, the Eastern District of New York um, has a venue over an enormous number of tax cases because there is an IRS uh, facility in Holbrook, New York, on Long Island, in Mm -hmm. the Eastern District of New York, that processes tax returns. And it's not only tax returns from the Eastern District, which which is Brooklyn, Queens, Long Island, and Staten Island. Um, but in Connecticut, from Connecticut, Mm -hmm. from Pennsylvania, from all over the Northeast, practically. Mm -hmm. And so we had venue for a lot of tax cases. Uh, uh, And for that reason, we prosecuted a lot of tax cases. And so because of that bizarre venue circumstance, um, I got to prosecute a lot of tax cases and in, in, um, in the white collar area. And so fortunately for me, I learned a lot about the criminal intelligence division of the IRS. I worked with the IRS agents. Um, I knew how things were done through Washington, through the tax division, and it was a real blessing for me. I just lucked into the situation and I was, uh, uh, I, to this day, I am benefiting from it. I, I was uh, friends with, um, um, this is going back 30 years now. I was head, head of friends, uh, I was, friends with the head of IRS CID. Okay. And uh, uh, we hired him to do, back when I was general counsel of a, uh, of a real estate company, mm-hmm. um, we hired him, he was, he was now uh, out, he was now a consultant, he was out of, it. He was out of uh, IRS. And we cool. hired him, but I guess in the government, you still get to have your, your badge, your retired badge. Okay. And, and so he flew in, I picked him up at the airport and we went to check him into hotel. And uh, as he checked in, I was standing next to him. I'll never forget this. He said, uh, government rate, please. 
and they have a form that you got to fill out. And, and so they asked him his name and he said his name. I'm not going to say his name here. They said his name and then they said badge number. And he said one. And they looked at him and said, like, what are the rest of the numbers? He goes, no, just one. <laughs> that was his badge number. I love it. That, that's great. Well, you know, what, what, what happens is when you work with these people, both the IRS agents mm -hmm. um, and the FBI agents in these matters, um, I developed a lot of respect for these people. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, you're dealing with some very substantial uh, people with, um, with integrity and uh, with skills um, uh, and integrity. I'm not saying all of them. Uh, uh, and I'm not saying that the, uh, that the FBI in particular didn't have some very serious leadership problems way back when. Um, and, uh, but again, uh, it, it's important for a defense lawyer to understand both the prosecutor that he or she is up against and the federal agents and what their, and what their perspectives are, what their processes are. That's why it's so helpful to uh, for a, a, a criminal defense lawyer to have been a prosecutor before that, because you're just switching sides. And I'm not saying that there are no people. I mean, uh, as an example, uh, Jerry Shargell in New York was a fabulous trial lawyer and a fabulous defense lawyer, and he had no prosecutorial experience. Uh, Jerry Leftcourt would be another one. Um, um, uh, Jerry's a good friend, and he's a fabulous lawyer. But um, by and large, having that, those are the exceptions, not the rule. <laughs> by and large, having, having that, having that um, experience is you know, very Jerry, good. Jerry Shargell used to share um, office space with my cousin for a while. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you remember Harold Greenberg, tax lawyer. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He was, uh, he was uh, um, I, I, I went to see Jerry on my case, actually. Yeah, well, Jerry was a very talented guy. He's now living in California, actually. He's retired. Oh, really? And he's and and, and Jerry's now, but Jerry Leftcourt is still mm. practicing law. So, um, you and Ken Kaplan decide to open up a firm. Um, do you know anything about running a firm? Do you know what it takes to run a firm, or what? How do you make that decision? Uh, well, as I say in the book. Um, Ken and I made the right decision for all the wrong reasons. And um, we had assumed that uh, through the connections we made, we would have a network of business mm -hmm. from various individuals or from other things. And most of those assumptions proved to be wrong. Um, but um, we followed the advice of Ken's late father, Harry Kaplan, who was a a very, very successful medical malpractice lawyer. And I remember this like it happened yesterday. Um, we had lunch with him the first week we opened up and he said, I have a bit of advice for you. I said, oh, okay, you know, the old man gives young, young guys advice, but with pearls of wisdom. And the advice was treat everyone who you come into contact with as a potential source of business. Mm. And by that, he meant that be respectful, show them how smart you are, but don't show off, care, be appropriate, and give them confidence in you. And the upshot of the story is decades later, I got a case in the Southern District of New York from a prosecutor in the district in Boston who I had a case against years before. Sure. A relative of hers had problems in New York and she was my opponent. She was, she and I went at each, at each other in a, a fairly contentious case. Mm -hmm. And yet she called me up and she uh, referred her, I, I believe it was a cousin to me. And I, actually there was an acquittal. <laughs> So, um, and, and, but, but that was the best advice that we ever got. And slowly but surely we developed relationships with people and had success in cases mm -hmm. and built the business. Mm -hmm. 
And we learned how to be businessmen too. We learned how to charge cases. We learned how to price them. We learned what our overhead should be. Mm -hmm. And um, it, 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 this is especially true in New York. You had to be either big or small. Yeah. Because if you were in the middle, if you and, and in, in New York, the middle is 80, 80 lawyers, 90 lawyers, 100 sure. lawyers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you're still paying the same amount per square foot for mm -hmm. office space. You're still paying the same amount for a really smart young associate who graduates from a top law school who joins you. Mm -hmm. um, you're still, at that time, you had many, many more secretaries. It, it, well, the overhead is the same, but you can't, with 80 lawyers or 70 lawyers or 60 lawyers, you can't compete with a 300 lawyer law firm or an international law firm. You, you just can't do it. Okay. Yeah. And so you have to be small or big. And we were four lawyers, ultimately. We were two partners and two associates. And if we got too busy, we would just go to um, uh, Columbia or NYU and get some really smart young man or woman to be a paralegal and to work for us. So what I, I, I don't think people know is how collegial the white collar bar has to be has and, to be. and if for no other reason that there's conflict of interest, there's multiple defendant cases where, exactly. where um, people are looking for referrals, you could have a dozen lawyers on one case easily. Totally correct. A, because of conflicts, totally correct. Yeah. That, that, that's exactly right. And you see, because what happens is within the contours of the white collar bar, um, it's a relatively small group, larger today than it was back in the day, but still a relatively small group. And if, for example, Jeff, you had a matter, uh, a, a witness or a client in an investigation, and I'm in the same investigation, and I can probably use some information from you about your client's perspective or whatever, I call you up, you know that today I'm in need of information from you, but tomorrow you might be in need of information from me. So if you're gonna be a jerk to me, um, it's a mistake because I'm gonna hold that against you in the future. Plus I'm gonna tell uh, all the other lawyers what a jerk Jeff was in this context. And they're gonna put that down in their little um, future reference folio and you've hurt yourself. Now, sure. obviously, there are things that everybody realizes you, you, you can't go too far, that there mm -hmm. are um, considerations of attorney client or whatever, but um, uh, there's, there's a lot of information that can be shared uh, in a joint defense context that becomes extremely important. And so there's a lot of collegiality. You may not personally like the other person, you may not personally even have great respect for the other person, but um, there is a combined need. Uh, there's a combined common interest, both present and future, that um, really creates a, a substantial amount of meaningful um, cooperation. Well, you were actually one of the founders of uh, a criminal defense bar yeah. association, is that right? Well, I, I was I was the first year draft pick. Um, the the <laughs> uh, what what happened was uh, Rudy Giuliani was the U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York, and um, he had not yet become completely crazy, um, but he was a very very aggressive prosecutor doing some really brutal things. Um, one example was a guy named Freeman, F-R-E-M-A-N, who was a uh, uh, high time, uh, high, high profile uh, business guy and uh, in Wall Street, Wall Streeter. Mm -hmm. And um, they, he had the FBI scoop Freeman off the floor, off the trading floor mm -hmm. in front of hundreds of people um, and to arrest him. Ultimately, uh, Freeman gets off. Mm -hmm. um, but... Anyway, so in, in response to what um, was perceived as Rudy's overreach, uh, Bob Mervillo and Gus Newman and Jimmy LaRosa 
and I would say about a half dozen of the superstars mm -hmm. of the bar, of the white collar bar, formed the New York Council of Defense Lawyers. And then uh, after it was formed the following year, about they took about another dozen or so. And I was in that dozen. I was on the uh, board of directors. Uh, there's a picture of me with that group um, in the book. Um, so yeah, the, the New York Council of Defense Lawyers became this vehicle for additional cooperation among criminal defense lawyers and the ability to go to the U.S. attorney as a group and say, you, you shouldn't do this or you should do that. And we became a pretty um, influential group. Yeah. And uh, it still exists today. Uh, I don't know what the coronavirus did, but um, the group's been in existence for decades and decades. Yeah, well, everything's different in uh, in, in COVID. The, sure. the whole the whole world's different. But you, yeah. but you single out three lawyers in particular. Yes. That you um, that I think you may have even called them the the best criminal defense lawyers in New York or in the world. Uh, Jimmy well, LaRosa. Defense lawyers that I tried cases. With. Oh yeah, that though. No. As I say in the book, um, you cannot really judge another lawyer's talent in the courtroom unless you are in that courtroom with him or her. Mm -hmm. Because it's only then when you know what the obstacles are. You know what the assets are. You know what the liabilities are. And, um, and so I probably tried cases with 60, 70 lawyers over the years. Um, I preferred mostly to try cases by myself. I was, I was happiest when I was the only defense lawyer, a single client. Because I didn't have to worry about anybody else. Because even if you have somebody who's very good with you, what if his or her client has different interests than yours? Of course. Okay, and so you, you want to be able to harmonize everything. Mm -hmm. And it's much easier to sing and harmonize things solo than four or five different voices being heard. Um, that, that, and that, that, that could actually be frightening if, if you don't know what they're going to get up and they're going to say or well, they're yeah, going to ask. Words, yeah, well, well, again, if you look in the, in the book, the... Um, the uh, Jeannie Gotti case, the Gene mm -hmm. Gotti case, um, there was a lawyer who just screwed everything up. Um, and we, every time he got up, we got, Ben Braffman and I got scared out of our minds. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's a difficult thing in a multi-defendant case. There's, there's, there's no question about that. But um, I'm steering off your, your question. I realize that, but... Uh, I got to the three lawyers because I tried cases with them of the 60 or 70. Okay. Um, these people were the best and um, were just so wonderfully talented. I would sit there with my mouth open during the trial and, you know, and Ben Braffman, who I became very close with and became a de facto partner. We shared office space for almost 30 years before I shut down New York for Kaplan and Katzberg. And he's still one of my closest friends. I speak to him all the time. I mean, uh, he wasn't Ben Braffman then. Yeah. He was just some young kid coming out of the Manhattan DA's office who uh, nobody knew. But, um, you know, it was like, uh, he's just, you know, listen, you know, it's like you're listening to Pavarotti sing. <laughs> tell, tell the story when, what, what did he do? He set up an easel in the back of the courtroom. What, what, what was that, what was that story? Yeah, but what, what happened was this, we had, um, there was, this was a, a multi-defendant mob case mm -hmm. and it was a, a RICO against um, uh, Angelo Ruggiero, um, Gene Gotti, and about six or seven other members of the Gambino crime family. All right, so for people who don't know what RICO is, it's a racketeering case. Yes, I'm sorry. It's, yeah. it's, it's the racket, it's a federal racketeering statute. Okay. Um, with very severe penalties. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, um, part of the RICO enterprise, part of the charges was that these mobsters would um, be in the drug business. 
one aspect of their illegal activities was sure. uh, heroin and cocaine. And um, there was a witness who came on the stand who called by the government, mm -hmm. who uh, explained that he had a drug transaction with a guy named Mark Ryder, who was Ben Braffman's client mm -hmm. and one of the defendants. And um, he produced a note with five little notations on it, uh, references to weight, uh, a price, I forget what the other three were now, but there were like five different things on the note. And he said that this was a note that he got from Ben's client about this particular drug deal. And the guy was a very good witness and the note was devastating. And um, this particular transaction spilled over on most of the defendants. And so it was important. It was a really crucial part of the trial. And when the direct examination was over, there was a lot of tension in that room. And Ben only adds to the tension. And again, we don't know he's Ben Braffman. I mean, we don't know he's the superstar yeah. that he will be. Um, Ben walks slowly to the back of the courtroom. And again, this is before the electronic courtroom of today. Today, everything's on screens. Yeah. And, and this is back in the day. Um, and so Ben goes to the back of the courtroom where, the, where he had pre-positioned an easel with a large um, white board. And he walks to the back and he slowly carries the easel into the well of the courtroom to set it up so that he's in front of the jury at the foot of the juror box and about to examine. And the pressure is just building. Now, what the hell is he doing? What, what, what is he gonna paint something? Okay. Did, did you know what he was gonna do? Oh, no, no, Ben and I developed a close friendship during and after the trial. Yeah. I didn't know him, he didn't know me. And it was only during the trial we developed the friendship. And, and so we were not, so no, nobody knew. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so what he does is he replicates the note on this large manila sheet, exactly what it was, but he replicates it on this large manila mm -hmm. uh, uh, page. And each time he says, okay, you, this is over here. And he says, and he starts to ask questions about each of these entries, relating them to another drug deal that mm -hmm. this witness had admitted to. And by the end of his examination, where he completely replicates this piece of evidence, it's plain to obvi it's obvious to everybody that the note reflects at least as likely, probably more likely, this other transaction, not involving Mark Ryder, not involving any of the defendants, that he spilled over to this case. It was, he turned um, dynamite into caviar. Yeah. And that, that was the time to me that the curtain opened up to me when I say, wow, this guy is talented. This guy is real. First of all, to have the ability to comb through all of the discovery material about this witness's history and to pluck out from just depths of, of, of data, that's information. Second of all, to have the courage to be doing this because it was very risky. This guy wasn't looking to help Ben. And he was a smart guy and a good witness. Right. To have courage to do that. And again, it's it it drives home the point that I'm making in the book that criminal defense work, trial work, is like being a stand-up comic. It's you have to have talent, you have to have preparation, and you have to have been doing it for many, many years to develop those skills. You don't learn that in law school. Mm -hmm. You can't write an essay about it. Okay, that doesn't that doesn't work. 
you know, my, my analogy is to stand up comics. I mean, I love Chris Rock, for example, but Chris Rock was not Chris Rock the first time he went out on a stage no. and some club owner allowed him 15 minutes at two in the morning. He had a, he had a bomb a few times. He had a, he had to change his, his routine. He had a, okay, he had to develop the skills to become Chris Rock. Le Same thing with the trial lawyer. Le learn his craft and become an exactly. expert at it. It's a, it's a performance art. It, so that it, was the Ben Brafton story. It, but it's, it strikes me that one of the things that a trial lawyer um, has to have, a good trial lawyer has to have is a, a certain kind of charisma. Yes. And there's a difference between the charisma that a trial lawyer would use on trial or might even use in negotiations with, with, um, with prosecutors, because that's a kind of charisma. Mm -hmm. And then the kind of charisma that a lawyer has with their own lawyer, with their own clients, where they're uh, managing expectations and they're, and they're working with people who are in the most difficult parts of their lives. I mean, these are sure. terrifying yeah, I, times. I, I, I understand what you're saying, but the, the situation is as follows. You do have to have a, a court presence and you do have to maintain this air, so to speak, mm -hmm. okay, in the courtroom, but you have to be yourself. Jurors are very good at spotting phonies. And if they think you are pretending to be something that you're not, your client's dead. Okay, you, so you have, to, you have to project the best of yourself, but it's gotta be the best of yourself. Yeah. And in terms of dealing with, with, with clients, I mean, to me, um, I had to gain their confidence. They came to me because somebody told them I did A, B, and C, in a previous case that they knew about and I was the one to handle their case or whatever, whatever it may be. Um, I had to gain their confidence and um, I had to gain their confidence by performing, by being thorough, by uh, being available. You know, one of the great things about having a small firm is um, I would tell clients because there'd be white collar sections of big firms Scat and Arps had was white collar, you know, all of these. Um, I would always say, listen, you know, <laughs> in my firm, I'm not going to lay you off on three associates. <laughs> right. It's me. Here I am. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you can call me whenever. You know, here's my here's my cell number or whatever it may be. Okay. Um, this is as important to me as it is to you. Yeah. Um, you know, and and so. Um, slowly but surely, you want to develop, have the client develop confidence in you because you want the client to listen to your advice. And how often, well, let's start to migrate into the purpose of the book because, okay. because um, the advice, no, and you talk about this in the book, there's, there's always a piece of the advice about what the, what the the plea deal might be or what the options are the opportunities or the or or maybe the case did not develop quite the way you thought it was going to be so how wh what's the relationship that you develop with the uh with the client and then over time how has that changed from when there was a much more trial centric um practice yes, that's, that's a good question. To, to the yes. point where where trials are very very rare yeah. Um, as I describe it in the book, a client comes to a lawyer, and this is not even only criminal, this is for anything, okay? Mm -hmm. But particularly in a criminal case, because they believe the client has, the, the client believes, uh, and it's hopefully true, that the lawyer has both the experience to understand what the problem is, to define the problem, and the skill set to solve the problem. Uh, you would you would come to, you, you go to a really good lawyer, okay, and it's up to him or her to determine whether the best way out of town is to ride a bike, to walk, to take a bus, to take a helicopter, or to drive. Okay, and that's the expertise of the lawyer to figure out the best way to protect the client. 
Today, not that many lawyers as before, far fewer lawyers than before, have the ability to try the case as the alternative to, uh, as one alternative to get a successful result. Mm -hmm. There are a number of cases where it's a triable case, where the plea being offered to the client is, is worse than or as bad as losing a trial. And so um, you want to go to somebody who can take you to trial. You want to go to a Ben Brathman. You want to go to a Jimmy LaRosa. You want to go to a Pat Tuitt from Chicago. Uh, the lawyers who, um, you know, you want to go to a top flight lawyer who can try the case. If there are fewer of those lawyers available today because of, 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 of the loss of trials, the defendant, the potential defendant, the client is, is really being, being deprived. You know, as, as, as I point out in the book, um, what you have is a situation where because over the years since the late 80s, trials have become less and less and less frequent in federal court. Mm -hmm. Trials have gone from 10% of all indicted cases to less than 2% of all indicted cases. Young lawyers are not developing trial skills. The middle, the middle age lawyers who should be in the prime of their career are having their skills rust based upon inactivity, okay? And the older trial lawyers are either retiring or dying. So the pool of available skill sets is diminishing and it's and and it's it's a tragedy for individual defendants it's a tragedy for america because the trial system the justice system is being skewed the role of the juror is being eliminated cases i are not I, being I, I, I want to i want to make sure that 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 we we make a point that you brought out in the book that I found so profound and that the prosecutors have gained much more power. And part of that is because we've eliminated the checks and balances on the role of the courts and the prosecutors because the of the uh, um, there's no more juries. And so you, you make a, 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 a very deliberate point in talking about the protections, the constitutional protections that were, that were put into place by our, uh, by our founders on the executive branch and the legislative uh, branch with the right of the vote, but on the judiciary branch by the right to serve on a jury. And, and if there's no juries, then the prosecutors basically are in charge. And, uh, well, am, I am I making the point correctly? Yes. I mean, um, first of all, it's called jury duty. It's a duty of the citizen <laughs> to serve on a jury. And um, while nobody likes to get a jury notice and people are taken away from their families, they're taken away from their businesses, particularly in federal cases that go on for weeks and weeks, sometimes months. Uh, the Ruggiero case where I told the Braffin story we were on trial for six months. So you're on jury duty for that period of time. I mean, that's really a, a, an obligation. But having said that, you know, quite often judges allow, when jurors are willing, allow lawyers in a case to have a interview with the jury after the case is over. And I can't tell you how many times in some of these post-verdict interviews that I've had, people express to me their happiness of having served, that they didn't want to do this to begin with. They were unhappy that they were left in the box when, when the jury selection process was over. But having now been part of the process, they are certainly happy that they did it and they understand the system a whole lot more. That's not happening anymore. It's happening much, much less frequently. So what the founding fathers envisioned has been eroding. 
and um, the role of the average citizen, a jury of your peers, okay, to protect against whether it's judicial overreach or prosecutorial overreach, okay, is, um, as I say, it's much, much less part of the system now. The system is now being uh, operated in, in a way that basically shuts out the average, the average citizen. Prosecutors have developed over the years since I was a prosecutor um, a, a much more power for two reasons. One is the law. Um, when I was a, a, a federal prosecutor, we weren't able to freeze client defendants' assets. Right. We weren't able to do a whole bunch of things. There was no racketeering statute when I was trying cases. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and, uh, when, as a prosecutor, I mean, um, and so the laws have gotten a lot stricter, giving the prosecutors much, much more, much more power. And of course, as you say, the, 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 the lack of jury trials. But all of this comes from all of the, in other words, how did 10% of cases going to trial fall to 2%? Was it yeah. just fortuitous? What happened? What happened was in the 1980s, the United States was rampant with lock them up mentality, war mm -hmm. on crime. Uh, if, if Jeff, you were running against me for Congress and I was perceived as much tougher on crime, I won and you lost. Mm. If you were perceived as some sort of peacenik or, you know, not a tough guy against, against those, those terrible criminals out there, mm. okay, you, you didn't have a shot. Mm. And so they, they ultimately were passing all these crazy laws in the state, particularly as to narcotics. And then the geniuses in the Congress came up with the federal sentencing guidelines, right. which um, is the reason why, the essential reason why there were so many fewer trials, because it made the risk of going to trial so much greater than it had been before. And so people were opting out, people were cooperating, they were doing all kinds of things under the guidelines because the guidelines were so oppressive People did not want to take a chance. Clients were afraid to take a chance to go to trial because the consequence of losing became that much more uh, serious, uh, dire. And so between 1990 and 2000, the federal prison population in the U.S. doubled. And that was a decade, as I'm sure we recall, with low crime. And from 2000 to 2005, it doubled again. It's crazy. We're locking up people at an absurd rate. So um, we, we often read about, actually I mentioned to you when we first talked, whether or not the topic that we're gonna talk about is the trial penalty and you kind of, set me straight on, on what that really means. So maybe you can just share, share, is it really a, an incentive to plea out? Is it a disincentive to go to trial? Is the disparity between those things so great that nobody wants to risk going to trial? It's, it's pretty close to that, yeah. Um, because um, the prosecutors now, and always, this has always been the case, even before the guidelines, but um, prosecutors can shape the charges to give you a deal, to allow you to plead to something that is less than the charge you would face if you're mm -hmm. saying to them, too bad, I'm doing nothing, let's go to trial. Mm -hmm. So you could plead guilty to say an offense that has a two year maximum as compared to an offense that has a 10 or two fives that you would be forced to face. And so people don't want to often take that risk. Um, and and um, the, the problem is multiplied by not only do the guidelines increase the jail time as a maximum sentence, but they did away with parole. Yeah. It used to be that if I was pleading guilty to a 10 year sentence, mm -hmm. 
at a third, I would become eligible for parole. I'd go in front of the parole commission. They say, well, you know, he's learned his lesson, but whatever. Okay. And I would be gone. Now there's no parole and you have to serve 85% of your sentence. So you're serving much higher percentage of a much higher sentence. And that's why the prison population became what it became. And that's why defendants were much more frightened of going to trial. And that's why defense lawyers were less emboldened to take somebody to trial. Mm -hmm. You know, a really good defense lawyer, the guys and the women that I was working with over the years, and, you know, very, very few of them are, are in the book, but they take what they do seriously. And as, and as, I, as I say in the book, I mean, what I did to me, um, I tried not to fall in love with clients. I tried not to dislike clients. To, I made it about myself. Right. Am I going to be able to bring about the result um, that only a really good lawyer, I think I am, <laughs> can achieve? It's in each, in each case, I would set my own sights on, you know, how, um, how high I could raise the bar in terms of the result and how do I get to it so that I could prove, so I, so that I could feel my, have the pride myself that, you know, the client made the right choice and um, so, I did what, what he or she needed. So Bob, the, so the Booker case comes um, around around 2006 or so. Okay. And changes the the rules that the sentencing guidelines are no longer mandatory. They're now right. advis they're, at, they're now advisory, right. advisory. So wh what does that mean over the last mm, twelve or fourteen years, in terms of the role of a criminal defense lawyer and how much more art ha comes back into the defense? Of a of someone, because now you're arguing for uh, variances and departures, and and and, sure. ju and judges are, especially in white collar cases, which is most of our audience. Um, it feels like I haven't I haven't seen a uh, a a, uh, a sentence that was in the guidelines. I haven't seen it in years. It feels like everything is is, is uh, departed down somehow. So what's that all about? Well, I mean, I don't know what the statistics are. The last statistics that I look, looked at was uh, from two years ago in terms of the book uh, that what was published in terms mm -hmm. of um, the, the federal criminal justice system, uh, the prison system or Bureau of Prisons or whatever. Um, but I can tell you that uh, you still ha you no longer have any judges or very very few judges, okay, that were judges in the old system before the guidelines, yeah. okay, um, and so you have judges, the substantial majority of judges who came to the bench under the guidelines, and that was the reality. Okay, um, and now you have maybe a third or whatever it may be of the district court judges who came on after Booker, but it really hasn't accomplished all that much because your prison population has stayed relatively steady. Your number of jury trials has stopped at 2%. It hasn't gone back up. In other words, yeah. if you look at the if you look at, uh, and, and, and so obviously whatever mitigation, I mean, what, what happened was when the guidelines were originally enacted, people went crazy. They thought it was the stupidest thing in the world. And it, it could have been liberal, you could have been conservative. You, you know, Sirica, not exactly Mr. Liberal, mm -hmm. was a big opponent of the guidelines. Mm -hmm. He called the guideline commission uh, the Junior Varsity Congress. Um, and so the, it, it, there was widespread skepticism mm -hmm. in the beginning and criticism as the guidelines 
uh, were more and more in effect. The federal sentencing guidelines were more in effect. Um, and the guidelines have changed over the years in a number of ways, improved over a number of ways. And the Booker um, compromise, because <laughs> again, the people were saying it's unconstitutional. The only right. way that the only way that they uh, salvaged the constitutionality of the guidelines was by making them advisory. Yeah, I mean, you know, in other words, what what the Supreme Court told us was, well, they're terrible, but they're not mandatory. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you very much. You know, and so but and and so while you know there have been improvements, the numbers are still the same. Yeah. What. One of the things, so there's two things um, that that we touched on in our previous conversation. One is um, how hard it is for a defendant to find a lawyer. Um, so a, a defendant is, uh, he's arrested or he's somehow notified that he's a target or whatever the, the however yes. he, he becomes aware. And then there's a point of entry issue because he now is entering into the legal system and doesn't really know where to turn. And there's, okay. and there's not really reliable information. It's not like there's a there, there's a there's a website you can turn to that's going to tell you who the exact right lawyer is for you. So, um, if you had to give some straightforward advice to someone who's now been arrested yesterday and is now making phone calls to their friends, their their corporate counsel, whoever they're making whoever they're making their calls to, I need a lawyer. Mm. What's the advice you give them? It's a, that's a great, great question. And it's difficult, you know, to answer. I, I have a, um, a friend who would, who's um, a Wall Street guy. And um, he would say that the two things that you have to avoid in this world are the need for a doctor and a lawyer. Because in both of those situations, you are at the mercy of circumstance in finding the right person and uh, have no control really. And um, what, 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 I would, what I would recommend is uh, the following. Obviously it will depend upon the nature of the crime. It would depend on the nature of the investigation. It would depend on, on, on a number of things, but okay, I would, um, I would look for somebody who has experience in that area I would look for somebody who um, has the ability, who, who, who has proven himself or herself in previous circumstances. So I go into your office, Jeff, and my, 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 my cousin Bernie says to me, you know, Bob, you got this subpoena and Jeff's the guy to go to. Okay, great. So I go into your office and I would conduct an interview. Mm -hmm. Don't be shy. Your life is on the line. Um, and I would first look around the office and see how substantial it was, quite frankly. Um, how many lawyers were involved. I would do a little bit of research. I would know who you are. And um, I would ask you, how many of these cases? And I would ask you, in terms of trials, have you ever tried a case like this before? That's a great question. Well, when was the last time you went to trial? Okay, um, and, I, and, 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 and is there somebody that you can refer me to mm -hmm. who can uh, corroborate or substantiate or back up or fill me in on, on the, and these are not, you know, and these are not maybe the most polite questions to ask, but you've got a lot at stake here. Mm -hmm. You're not there to be Mr. Personality and to get a TV show. You are there to get protection. You're there to get advice. You are there to be saved from the worst consequences of the potential that face you. Um, now, the problem with that is that there are, frankly, lawyers out there who will lie. And without getting into his name, one of the people you and I <laughs> discussed the last time um, is somebody who might do just that. You know, and, and, and there is some just, and but again, you have to do the best you can. 
in terms in, 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 in terms of ferreting that out. But, but aren't aren't these aren't these people? They're not clients yet, obviously, but they're That's people. Right. Who, but aren't they at the, their most vulnerable and they're in the midst of trauma? How do they even trust their own ability to dis discern what's totally good correct. or bad or? No, no, no. This is a difficult situation to be in, but that's where the lawyer has to project the level of confidence in the client right off the bat. Mm -hmm. Okay, and has to project the kind of expertise and experience that the client can feel comfortable in, you know, hiring that particular lawyer. And it's not easy. Um, and there's no litmus test. There's no short answer. There's no essay. There's no exam to take. Uh, but people get vibes. People understand where things are. and lawyers get vibes from. From you know, I mean, I would always try to figure out: is this person being totally honest with me? Did, did you ever um, at a at a at a prospective client interview? Mm -hmm. um, did you ever tell uh, someone, "I don't think I'm the best choice for you"? Sure. And so what, what's that about? How, how, how would you figure that out? How would you impart that information? And then would you, for, for example, give them names of other attorneys to go talk to? Yeah, in other words, if, if somebody came to me, uh, let's say, for example, someone um, were, had received a, um, a phone call from a federal agent. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was involved in, well, there are a number of, uh, let, me, let me back up a second. There are a number of circumstances when you would do that, okay? Um, one, which happens a surprising amount to the more successful lawyers, is is there a conflict? Sure. Um, somebody comes into my office and they start talking to us. I stop. <laughs> okay. Uh, I can't personally represent you. I can't tell you who I represent, but I have an, I have a matter that directly relates upon the subpoena that you got or whatever mm -hmm. it may be. And so, uh, let me end this conversation. I'll be happy to refer you to somebody else, but okay. I can't represent you. That's one circumstance. Okay. Another one is where it's just totally in a, in a very uh, narrow area that is beyond your expertise, mm -hmm. where this is not really so much of a white collar criminal problem, but this is a regulatory problem where your problem is with the SEC. And there's really nothing criminal about what you're, what you're talking about here. Um, there may be some SEC violations. There may be some of licensing or other kinds of issues. Uh, let me refer you to so-and-so who used to be with the SEC, who's now with a big firm, you know, or whatever. Those would be the two circumstances where you would say to a client, let me refer you, let me refer you to someone else. The third area would be money, where the client simply cannot afford your fees. And the client, this has happened more than once, where the client says, look, you know, I mean, uh, I would love to be able to hire you. I'm just, um, you know, all my assets are frozen or whatever it may be. I have no money, whatever, whatever it may, may be. Uh, is there somebody that you know, who maybe is not you, okay, but who's somebody who, and I would do that, of course. Well, one of my particular issues is with lawyers who don't give the full story to the client or, about, or what the risks actually could be. I mean, here's an example. A, a, a client comes to a lawyer and it's a healthcare fraud issue. And so the client is being investigated by HHS or, and, and there's, a, a, there's a period of time where it's being negotiated. It could wind up with a civil penalty. It could wind up with uh, all kinds of different things. But 
the lawyer doesn't tell the client and it is possible that there is going to be a criminal prosecution if this doesn't go well, or even if it does go well, there still might be a criminal prosecution. So sure. I want you to see what the whole picture is from day one so you understand it so that you're not confused, that you're not, you don't think you're hiring me to get from point A to point B when there's really a point C out there that you have to know about. Absolutely, um, that's, that's a great question. Um, I always operate out of an abundance of paranoia. Um, my job is to discern what all the potential problems are. Mm -hmm. That's why you're hiring me. Okay. And um, I have to lay out to you the realistic scenario of what's out there. That's why you came into my office. And I'm not there to scare you. I'm not there to, to, to but I, but it, one of the things that I, that, that I try to avoid all the time is hearing from a client say, is having a client say to me, why didn't you tell me that? Exactly. Okay, that's, that's a failure by the lawyer. Why didn't you tell me that? You know, um, thank God that I've heard that very infrequently. Because to me, my job was to lay it all out. And again, not to scare the client, but just to make sure that he or she understood the road mm -hmm. that we're traveling here and what the various stops were and where it may end. Because otherwise, the client can't appreciate what your strategy is to begin with. You know, I, 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 I tell the story in, in, in the book of um, a, a, uh, a white collar case where uh, a uh, young, aggressive Wall Street guy in a small firm, in a small trading firm, uh, came to me to represent him, having been referred by a colleague of his, mm -hmm. because a, another firm, a much bigger trading firm, mm -hmm. was in a litigation with the SEC. And he was afraid that that SEC civil litigation of this larger trading company would uncover the fact that these two firms, his firm and the big firm in litigation were manipulating trades. We're going back and forth in a way that I can't describe as attorney client, but <laughs> that, that, that they were doing some pretty serious stuff. Yeah. And he was afraid that um, that litigation not involving his firm would uncover in discovery Sure. all of their shenanigans mm -hmm. and uh, so he hired me um, with a substantial retainer mm -hmm. um, and uh, fortunately for me and the client the lawyer representing the big firm in the SEC was a former federal prosecutor in the southern district of New York who I had a number of cases with mm -hmm. and I had a relationship that's the white collar network again here we go again sure and um I did all my work and I, she gave me some real good insights and I pulled all the documents, I did everything. And I realized that his fears were not really well-founded, that the chances were overwhelming. So I bring him back to the office after about two or three weeks of digging through everything and meeting with her and whatever. And I said, well, he, he said, well, what do we do now? I said, we do nothing. He said, what do you mean we do nothing? I said, we do nothing because the chances are overwhelming that the nature of this litigation will not have, will not expose what you were doing. And he had wanted to do all kinds of crazy things, you know, to be aggressive, you know. Mm -hmm. So he said to me, I paid you all that money to do nothing. And I said, no, 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 you paid me all that money for my advice. And my best advice to you is to do nothing. You don't want to rock a boat that's not coming your way. You don't want to draw and attention to yourself. Right. Yeah. And sure enough, it just went away. But it, it's, in other words, we were planning, we were looking at what the worst could be, but it was obvious from 
the loads of discovery in the SEC case, that they were going in a different direction. And, but so many of these clients are type A, go, 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 go getter, um, take no prisoners guys. And that's the, the problem. And, and, and um, I, when, when, I, when I was general counsel to uh, uh, one of the companies I represented, we had our first meeting with a very well-known member of the uh, of the white collar bar, uh, Jack Hoffinger. Remember Jack? No. Yeah. And we had our first meeting with Jack Hoffinger, which was a beautiful meeting, by the way. Mm -hmm. And um, well, it was in a beautiful setting. I think it was in the Quilted Giraffe. And, and <laughs> my favorite, my my favorite restaurant of all time. And I had a very wealthy client. And. The time came for when Jack was going to tell the client how much the case was going to cost. Right, what the fee was. The fee was. And he and Jack threw out this huge number. And my client, you could see him recoil. And I was his general counsel, but you could see my client physically recoil at the number. And he said, why would it be that much? And, he, and Jack looked at him and said to him, Half of it is for what you already screwed up. And the other half is what you're going to screw up over the next five years because you can't help yourself. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the, the, the old joke about um, charging fees among mm -hmm. white collar lawyers, the, the old um, formula for how you, how you charge white collar fees, uh, it was you want to shock them within their means. Oh my God! I'm, I'm being honest with you. I, I know. I know. It, it's a joke, you know. It was, but it's, you know, um, it's not it, it, in terms of, you know, a lot of these things. It's, it's not um, uh, that far off. It's, no. uh, you know, reasonably close. But, but, but you know, but, but, but again, um, sometimes you could be paying for somebody who's just not worth it. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, and, so let, 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 let's let's meander back uh, into into the book, so you sure. can make some some takeaways here, what that people can walk away with. Because most of the people who watch this uh, or or listen to this podcast, they're they're people either right now or in the ensuing months, especially as litigation picks back up um, um, yeah. through COVID. They're going to be listening with a keen eye. Uh, they're going to be watching or listening with a keen eye or ear to wh wh what do I need to take away from this? What's I, I have someone here who can give me really good, solid advice, um, not legal advice, but but advice about the system. Um, is the system broken? Are we uh, are, are, are we uh, are we uh, just pawns in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a bigger play that we have very little effect over? Is there still room for people or lawyers who have uh, um, great skill to be able to um, deliver better results? Where, where are we? Um, the comparison that I make, the analogy that I use in the book to where we are with the criminal justice system, the federal criminal justice system, and the vanishing trial, and the fact that we have so few trials and fewer and fewer talented trial lawyers to conduct them available to people who need them. The analogy that I use is to the uh, coral reefs, that we are losing coral reefs in this world. Mm -hmm at a tremendous danger to human existence. And we are losing trials and trial lawyers and jurors at that kind of threat to the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. And we can't go on much longer like this. Um, we have, and that's what the book is addressed, it is a call to drastic action. And there's all these things that have been fed to the public, the recent, uh, I think it was a year ago, a year and a half ago, uh, not probably about two years ago now, the so-called First Step Act um, that uh, uh, everybody was so, was, was touting as this great bipartisan, okay? 
it is a first step, but it's a small step. Yeah, yeah. It's a very small step. We need to take, we can't afford baby steps. We need to take giant leaps. And whether that amounts to getting rid of the guidelines completely and just going back to the system that it was um, uh, that it was before um, and going the opposite way in terms of federal statutes to reduce mandatory minimums, mm -hmm. uh, to eliminate mandatory minimums, to reduce maximum sentences. We need drastic, substantial criminal justice reform now. And if we can get that now, if we can get that over the next year or two, then trials will return. Then lawyers will be in the courtroom developing the kind of skills to be a Ben Braffman, to be a Pat Tuit, to be a Jimmy LaRosa as described in the book. Um, my, the purpose in the book is that I wanted to cre recreate that world because we get all of these ridiculous images of, of the courtroom from TV and the movies, and they're a joke, they're ridiculous. I want the average person to know what it's really like to be in these situations. Yes. What, real, what, what, what real lawyers actually do, what the great ones can actually accomplish so that they can appreciate what we're losing. You know, I mean, there's not a movie that I haven't seen where the cross-examiner is not nose to nose with the witness, okay? Um, it, it, you know, breathing, you know, it, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, I mean, it's crazy because they have to overly you know, dramatize the situation, but it's a dramatic situation anyway. Sure. And it, it, but it, they just don't present it in, mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in a clear, realistic way. The book is a, clear presentation as best as I can make it of the reality. I, use, you know, I name names. These are real cases. This is from the transcript. This is the way it really is. This is, this is what courtroom life really was and really was like. And so I want to give the reader that understanding so that he or she will know what we're losing. So, uh, Bob, um, just in wrapping up here, like like the uh, like the Dodgers did in the fifties, you abandoned New York for California, correct? And so now you're sitting out there near the beach, um, in. Uh, yeah. I, I I now live in a beach community uh, called Manhattan Beach um, in um, Los Angeles County. Mm -hmm. uh, part of the benefit is I'm very close to LAX Airport. Yeah. I, I do a lot of I do a lot of flying. Um, in terms of my practice, my practice is substantially now tax, international tax, um, money that's overseas. Um, but um, I'm now with Holland and Knight, 1,300 lawyers around the world. Yep. And I do a lot of the white collar stuff. I uh, got a huge case in Chicago, the Northern District of Illinois. And, but what it, it's allowed me to be much more selective in what yeah. I do. And so I'm, Holiday Night is nice enough to me to um, allow me to pick and choose mm -hmm. the cases that I'll become involved in. If there's somebody, um, you know, that needs something um, and it's just not something I want to get involved in, I won't. Uh, it's kind of luxury I did not have when I was a four-person firm. Sure. And how do people, how would people get in touch with you? Well, uh, you can find me on the Holiday Night website. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, H and K Law, mm -hmm. and you can email me uh, uh, through Holland and I through my uh, uh, email address. And I am technically with the New York office because of the bar situation. Yeah. Um, but I, but I, I am because of the, the bar issue. I'm only involved in federal type. I only involve myself in in federal matters. Um, so so in federal matters, you don't have to. Come in pro hoc. Do you, you can? Uh, well, you know, what I do. What I do is I, I I am licensed. I just go pro hoc vici. I just ask the court to admit me for the purposes of that case. That case, right? Like in Chicago, for the Northern District of Illinois, for mm -hmm. example, um, I'm admitted to that court. 
for the purposes of that um, enormous white collar case that's been going on forever. Um, and, 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 and so that's, that's generally what I do. I've been, uh, over the last few years, I've been in Switzerland a lot, again, before the, the pandemic, uh, in Switzerland a lot, in uh, Singapore, and in Hong Kong. That's a lot of where the money has gone in the post UBS situation. You know what happened with UBS in sure. 88. And so I, have a, I still have a lot of clients with overseas money, those issues. Mm -hmm. And um, fortunately at Holland the Night, I have a really substantial tax, civil tax group behind me, a fabulous international tax. So I've been doing a lot of that as well. Mm -hmm. Well, Bob Katzberg, thank you so much for My being pleasure. with us. I'm gonna I'm gonna hold up the book again, "The Vanishing Trial" by Robert Katzberg, and uh, there will be a substantial show notes um, for people to be able to get in touch with you and a link to buy the book on Amazon. And again, it's already been sent into uh, seven or eight prisons, so I'm sure it's going to be circulating around there because that's what happens in when you're sitting in prison. But by the way, what, what's going to happen here, just so you know, is that there'll be a, a bunch of all the caucus sitting around um, at Otisville, uh, at, at Otisville, and they're part of our I've support. Been, what's that? I've been to Otisville. <laughs> I'm sure you have. <laughs> and, and they'll be talking about this podcast because right. there, there's such a hunger for straightforward information. For, yeah, the, yeah. for the real deal. And I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to bring it to everybody. So thank you so much for being with us. My pleasure. Thanks okay. again. All right. Thanks. All right. We're out. Nicely hey. done. Good questions. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful interview. Thank you so much. No problem. And so um, you already have my email, I would assume, because I've been doing yeah, We have everything. Oh. So in terms of somebody who wants that, that's great. But as someone who's now bought nine copies of your books, I can tell you, I would like a, a uh, inscribed copy. Absolutely. Yeah, because Absolutely. I, you see, you see this, this little pile in back of me here is all inscribed copies of people who've been on our podcasts. It would be my pleasure. Uh, How do I do that? Send it to me. Okay. Uh, the, uh, I'll, I'll work with Chloe on it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, the, the, the only issue is going to be that I am in a total lockdown now. It's all right. Don't worry about it. Um, and so I'm not going to be leaving my home. <laughs> I mean, as beautiful as Southern California is, we've got a, a rampant. Oh, yeah, I know. I mean, we are in really. And mm. so I received my first vaccine shot. But until I get my second one and then I wait about 10 days. I'm staying in the house, so I won't be able to ship you anything until no the no end worries. of February. I got my second one on the 27th. Oh, you did? Oh, yeah. Right. So, yeah. so you're, you're, you're almost home. We'll see. With all these variants now, who knows what's going on? Oh, my no, God. I, I, no, and I, I just have, I have a very close friend who lives in Rhode Island, uh, who I went to law school with, mm -hmm. who just got it, who got not the shot, got the vaccine, got the virus. Yeah. And um, he's been really bad for the last week. Mm -hmm. It's something you want to avoid. Well, if, if we have a, if we have a follow-up call, I'll, I'll tell you some stories about, about some of our, our support group people who the, the, they've been on diesel therapy during COVID. So they're actually catching COVID while they're in custody. Oh. Uh, and the guy I spoke to yesterday, who's at um, in Rhode Island, what's the name of the, the uh, detention center up there? Um, I can't remember the name of it, but they have a detention center up in Rhode Island. So for six months, he's in lockdown in New Haven Correctional. They keep him in the state because they don't want to transfer him. Yeah, exactly. So uh, about three weeks ago, they tell him that he's he's uh, to, he's wanted. Uh, they're coming to get him. He was wanted back in court. He said, "I've been sentenced already. They don't want me back in court." And because they said to him, "No, you're you're uh, you wanted back in court." So they deliver him to the 
to to the loading dock to to uh, R and D at New Haven, and the marshals are there, and the marshals tell him that they're taking him to Rhode Island, and he had no notice whatsoever. And they asked him, "Have you have you had a COVID shot, a COVID test, and to, um, uh, recently?" And he looked at them and he said to him, "You're asking me." <laughs> shouldn't shouldn't that be something you should know before you come pick me up? And they said, go back to your cell. We're sending you back to your cell until you get your COVID test. They gave him the COVID test, rapid COVID test, put him in the van, take him to Rhode Island. Three days later, he comes up positive. And now, so he, so he caught it in the midst of this oh. transfer, this transfer, in the van with six guys from six other Connecticut prisons, unbelievable. I know it's 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 just it's just crazy. But I mean, at least you are pretty close to the end now. I mean, you get you know, you, you only have an, uh, just days before you can feel a level of comfort. Oh yeah, I want to see my grandchildren badly. Yeah, me too. I mean, that's why I'm living in California. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, uh, so, but anyway, listen, it's great to meet you. Great Thank to you speak. too. And maybe someday in the future, in a post-COVID world, we can share a meal or something. We would. I, I love LA. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, I'm, as I say, I'm, I'm 15 minutes from the airport, door to door. Thank you so much, Bob. Thank you. Be well. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us on White Collar Week, sponsored by Progressive Prison Ministries. You can learn more about us on our website, prisonist.org. That's prisonist, like feminist. And please remember to rate, review, and share this podcast so that families suffering in silence can find us if they need us. See you next time.